Extreme weather conditions and no end in sight. More and more parts of the world are reporting new heat records. Temperatures sometimes reaching life-threatening levels, like in the U.S. or in China's northwest. This comes as forest fires burn thousands and thousands of urgently needed trees. Torrential rains cause floods in one part of the world, while others are seeing droughts. The fact is, weather extremes are on the rise. Yet the Earth has only heated up by an average of 1.1 degrees. If the goal of limiting warming to a maximum of 1.5 degrees were to be reached, the effects would probably be even worse. So on to the point we ask record heat, drought and extreme weather. Can we still adapt? Hello from Berlin and a warm welcome to this week's To The Point. I'm Javier Arguedas and I'm joined by our guests in the studio this week that I'd like to introduce. Claudia Kempfert is the head of energy, transportation and environment at the German Institute for Economic Research. Matthew Karnichnik is a journalist and correspondent with Politico here in Berlin. And Mekonnen Mesgena is the head of migration and diversity at Germany's Heinrich Böll Foundation. To all of you, welcome. Thank you for taking your time for being with us today. And Claudia, I'd like to start with you on this very complex, uh, but a topic that different, differently also um, hits everyone. Everyone is talking about uh, the heat waves, storms, hurricanes in the summer here in Europe. And yet some say this is just the regular weather phenomena. What has changed? What is different? Now, what is different is that we have more weather extremes. That means the fires that we see, the droughts, and also sometimes extreme rainfalls, which could also bring, I mean, some kind of uh, extreme um, cases in all of the world. And this has been changed. It's not only weather, it's climate change. And that means that we are on a global level of 1.1 degrees Celsius. And if it reaches more, then we see even more and extreme weather events all over the globe. Now, this seems like something that is getting more extreme um, and some are shocked. Um, McConnell, I'd like to ask you, this is maybe a little bit newer in the northern hemisphere, but the so-called global south has seen it a long time ago. So are we only giving this level of coverage because it's dark skies in New York City and extreme temperatures in Rome? That's definitely true. I mean, um, there have been always cycles of drought in many countries in Africa and uh, cycles of uh, floods, rising sea levels, etc. in many Asian countries. So we had it in the history. But now the, um, the, um, the amount of uh, climate change has been changing the, the, the lifestyle of people dramatically. People are heavily under pressure because they have been losing their livestock, they have been lo losing their farms, so uh, locusts, uh, over flooded uh, areas, etc. So the implication of climate change is massive in other countries. So still we, we are affected by it, but we are still in a privileged cocoon, I would say. So the effects in other hemispheres, in the Southern Hemisphere, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, is massive. So I think we need to shift the perspective as well. Matthew, you come from the U.S. state of Arizona that has been particularly hit uh, in the last few days. What are you hearing from people back home? Well, it, it's always hot there, to be fair, at this uh, time of year. It's always uh, well above 100 degrees uh, Fahrenheit so in, in the 40s Celsius. What's changed now is that you have really long periods of really extreme heat. And so you're looking at 45 to 48 degrees over weeks. And it's, it's really something I think that you know, people start to feel in their bones in a way that they don't normally. My my mother has a dog that she likes to take walking, for example, but now the, the sidewalks are too hot to uh, to take the dog out, so she had to put little boots on the dog. Unfortunately, I think he ate some of the boots. <laughs> had to find another solution. But uh, it, it is really, it's gotten to the point where even at night, where because it's a desert there, it normally would cool at night. It's no longer really falling, you know, that much at night. The temperature, so it's it's really something that uh, is is hitting everybody who lives who lives in that region. 
Everybody is feeling it, and yet discussions about climate are always difficult and to a certain extent abstract. Nobody can really predict exactly what is going to happen tomorrow or in a month. But a simple look at the disasters of the last few weeks already shows that evidence of the destructive force of climate change is hard to ignore. The U.S. is being hit particularly hard by extreme heat waves. In the west and south of the country, there are record temperatures of up to 46 degrees Celsius. The National Weather Service warned of an extremely dangerous heat wave with no cooler temperatures in sight for millions of people. China and southern Europe are also suffering under record high temperatures. Heat waves are prompting health warnings. Tourist sites are closing due to extreme weather. Worldwide, it's the hottest June on record. The extreme drought increases the danger of new fires worldwide. In Canada, wildfires have been out of control for weeks. Clouds of smoke have even reached Europe. Months of drought and no rainy seasons. In many regions of South America and Africa, there is no water and no food, which makes them unhabitable. In complete contrast, torrential rain in India is causing floods and landslides in the northern part of the country. Dozens of people have lost their lives, and large parts of the capital city, Delhi, are underwater. Will it only get worse? That's, of course, the question. It's hard to stay optimistic when we see images like that. Claudia, as a researcher, though, will it get worse? Unfortunately, yes, because uh, we see from or we know from from climate science uh, that uh, shows that the emissions that has been already in the atmosphere will bring more extreme events like this in the future. And this is what we cannot, um, I mean, stop anymore. This will happen for sure. But what we can do is to bring the emissions down, the global uh, greenhouse gas emissions coming from fossil fuel burning uh, down to a level that the uh, most severe impacts can be can be lightened, so to say, and that can be I mean, stopped, not stopped, but uh, limited to a certain extent. And that is what we have to do. But unfortunately, um, we see only, this is only the beginning, and we will see much worse impacts in the future. Why is it so difficult to pre bring people on board, though, Matthew? People see the images, they hear that the solutions are there. Do you think maybe people think it's not going to hit them personally? I, I think that's one, one aspect of it. And the other aspect is that people don't want to give things up. If you have a, a nice SUV, for example, and you live in the United States and you like driving that car, uh, if you have a big air conditioner um, cooling your you know, 10,000 square meter house. Those are things that people are, are want to give up. I mean, I'm exaggerating with these examples, but um, I think that that's part of it because, you know, I think ultimately to resolve these problems is going to mean that we're going to have to change the way we live. And I think that reality has, has not hit enough people in the wealthier uh, countries around the world, including the United States and including uh, much of Europe still, I would argue. A lot of people on, on Earth have to give things up uh, because they have no choice. But here we have a choice and we can still drive an SUV, which is electric driven, for example, or uh, the air conditioning coming from renewable energy. Electricity might be an alternative. So here in the rich countries, we have technological solutions which we can, or which are there, but we have to implement. And here the fossil fuel lobby is very strong in trying to extend their their business models as long as they can, but uh, we have solutions which we can change. Yeah. But you mentioned an important point. Some people have no choice, uh, McConnell. In some countries, people actually have to leave where they live uh, in order to find uh, another place that is uh, yeah. habitable. Absolutely. Uh, that seems mm -hmm. to move some people here in Europe, uh, the fear of the climate migration, which is a real threat. Do you think that could lead to more climate action, ultimately? Well, that's the other uh, scenario, the other threat, perhaps. Migration is something also which is which people also feel as a threat in North America, in Europe. So while we are discussing here, are we feeling what are the effects of climate change for us? So how do we convince people? How do we uh, bring more consensus? That's the one thing. The other thing is we have to act urgently in other areas of the world, because for them, it's not something in the future, it is already the reality. So 
there is a huge pressure. Actually, as a human being or as a mankind, we have to be extremely vigilant and also find an urgent solution because people are already losing their existence. So that's the other reality. While we are here still struggling to give up some of our privileges, so how do we uh, manage our privilege? So we are talking about management of privilege here, while others are already struggling to survive. So these are two narratives we have uh, in this global debate. But how do you make that case, uh, Matthew? No politician will stand up and say, hey, we will have less economic growth, uh, you will have less privileges, but we're going to be more sustainable. How does that work? Well, I think what has to happen is what's happening now to, to really get people's attention about the dire situation that we're in uh, globally, because until you get temperatures like what we're seeing in Rome or like what we're seeing in, in Greece now, for example, or in, 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 in the U.S. and parts, people just aren't paying attention. There was a massive flood last year, for example, in Pakistan. Thousands of people were killed. I mean, this was, you know, sort of a biblical proportions, this flood. I don't think that anybody in Europe... You you know, is, is talking about that anymore or has any sort of, you know, real knowledge of what the consequences of, of that flood were, although they were they were epic. And I, I think it really has to hit home here before people, you know, really start taking it uh, seriously and before that is transferred into actual policy of the kinds of things that uh, Claudia is talking about. Uh, th there are potential solutions. We're not there yet. Um, you know, Germany, for example, is trying to shift to renewable energies, has made a lot of progress on that front, but is still burning coal, for example. China is still opening new uh, coal-fired power plants, for example, which is incredible when, when you think about where we are. So I think, you know, it, it needs to really hit home in these countries and for people to feel it personally before we're going to see genuine change. When we talk about making an economic case as well, we know that there are potentials, but people don't seem to get it that uh, actually doing climate action can bring more wealth. Yeah, and it could, because uh, if you look at the solutions, like an electric car, for example, of course it's now more expensive than a uh, uh, um, conventional car, but this is changing soon, and then the people have a choice. Or also electricity coming from renewables, if, uh, if you have a solar panel on your roof, it brings cheap electricity, but you have to pay for the solar panel. So, uh, But this all brings economic growth, and this all brings economic chances, and this is where we are, uh, the solutions are there, but we are we have also to face that the fossil fuel industry wants to extend their business models as long as, loon, as, long as they can, and they do everything uh, to extend it. Uh, but uh, as soon as we have solutions which are cheap and also affordable for the people, they will they will use it. I'm pretty sure. But what do you make of this? tendency to say, there are technological solutions, you don't have to do anything, mm -hmm. we will take care of it. Well, we need both. Uh, I mean, we need the uh, regulation where the companies, I mean, have to pay a higher CO2 prices or have to change their business models because they are forced to do so. On the other hand, uh, we need solutions also for the people, and the people can do it itself a lot if they, uh, for example, install a, a solar panel on the roof. They are part of the solutions. And here uh, we have solutions, but uh, right now, uh, especially, especially in the industrial countries, uh, we have a lot of choices, but in many other countries of the world not. And here we need global solutions, which is really important. And I think, if just I may add, not only the ethical, the moral issue, but I think the economic incentives are also very important, that there's a lot to win mm. by, by shifting, by having this transformation. If we see into the uh, electro vehicle industry, um, apparently pressure was necessary to shift the perspective of those uh, companies or industries which were well established. So, of course, they had the, the know-how, of course, they had the technologies, but sometimes pressure, but also um, political move is also very important in order to motivate also other companies and also well-established companies to make a transformation. So I think we need both, you know, like uh, debating, talking, but on the other side, putting some economic incentives into the whole uh, transformation. You mentioned it, political move can be very important, pressure as well. The fact is, 
This battle can't be won without the two biggest emitters of greenhouse gases. We're talking about the U.S. and China. Despite delicate relations, representatives of both countries met to talk about urgently needed measures. Currently, the world is facing a daunting challenge of climate response. It is necessary for China, the United States and indeed all countries in the world to strengthen coordination, build consensus and speed up action. China and the United States are the two most powerful economies in the world. We also have to be the two largest emitters of greenhouse gases. And so the imperative of our two countries coming together and working and showing the rest of the world how we can cooperate and begin to address this with the urgency it requires. So we've seen leaders of the U.S. and China seemingly working together, what can they actually do? Well, they can do a lot because combined, I think they account for about 40 percent or so of, of global emissions. And, uh, you know, China in particular, if you look at the, the CO2 chart of China since 1990 or even since 2000, it looks like a hockey stick. It's gone, you know, really, really uh, surged upward. Um, the United States is still the, the, the largest emitter per capita, um, but at least it's not rising. CO2 emissions haven't, haven't uh, arisen recently, and that's, I think, mainly because the U.S. has switched to gas, natural gas, and, and, and moved away from coal. But because these two countries are interdependent economically, I think that the negotiations between them could really sort of take the world in, in the right direction. Because if you look at other countries in Europe, Germany, for example, accounts for only 2% of, of global CO2 emissions. So whatever Germany does might set a good example, but it's not really going to move the needle further. So you need these two countries, you need the U.S. and China in lockstep here to really take measures that are going to bring emissions down. And unfortunately, because there have been tensions between the two countries over the past few years, you've seen that effort go a little bit off the rails. And China, for example, has started to uh, use more coal because that's what they have at home. They don't have other sources of energy, really. So they revert to using coal. And I think it, it needs you need this negotiation and trust between the two countries in order to move this process forward. And then the rest of the world is watching McConnell and maybe other countries think, why do we have to implement measures against climate change if these two are responsible for so much uh, percentage of it? Yeah, I mean, this debate, we had this the last 30, 40 years. Um, why do we pay the price uh, uh, for others' emissions? You know, it's uh, at the cost of our, our development. So how can we catch up to the development of the north, the global north and so on? So we have all this discussion and yet we don't have any other alternative than really to, you know, like to push for a new agenda, a new... Um, uh, uh, ecological uh, transformation, etc. Et so maybe we need to jump over this uh, ambition to make development at the cost of uh, the environment. So, I mean, it is an ethical debate that many, the, glo the Global South ha says also, it's also our right to develop. Yeah. Uh, but then, you know, it is an urgent issue because people in the Global South are dying. They are losing their... Um, uh, uh, existence and also their livestock and uh, their homes. So every year, around 20 million people are leaving their homes because of the drought. 20 million people within the countries, then next to the um, neighboring countries, and some are even shifting to another continent. So this is the reality right now. And maybe by the end of this uh, century, it may be up to 1 billion people will be on the move. So yes, the Global South has the right to develop, but also the responsibility uh, to be part of this transformation. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you cannot trust the big, powerful countries, solutions can also come from a local level. The majority of the world's population lives in cities. Climate change is particularly noticeable here, especially in the form of extreme heat and rising sea levels. New ideas are needed to ensure that metropolises do not soon become uninhabitable. The sea has already engulfed most of the beach. The Egyptian city of Alexandria could be in ruins soon. This concrete wall is supposed to protect the city's more than 5 million inhabitants from rising sea levels. 
In the Netherlands, floating houses are being used to adapt to the rising water levels. Heat is stored in asphalt and concrete. To combat this, green spaces are being used. This skyscraper in Singapore is supposed to cool itself. A total of 25,000 square meters of vegetation helps the facade to be seven degrees cooler than the surrounding temperature. Also, these light colors in Morocco have a cooling effect. The Indian industrial metropolis Pune relies on parks and expanding bike paths. Another method, using a lot of water to cool down like the shower in Tokyo. How can we best protect ourselves against climate change? Claudia, when you see those solutions, do you think that's the right way? That's where we need to Yeah, get? it's an important way because most of the emissions are coming from cities, but also we need to adapt. And this is why we need cooling spaces. We need other, I mean, buildings uh, like we are doing right now, that they offer more cooling, more water for the people. And here we have both, on the one hand, solutions to protect climate by getting the emissions down, but also the solutions for helping people to adapt and to, to live in a way. Uh, and right now, uh, a lot of cities uh, do not offer it in a, uh, enough uh, for in many ways, especially if we are looking in Germany. I mean, the big cities have n are not facing it right now, and here we need yeah. to change, yeah. But yet that also costs money, McConnell. Costs a lot of money, and um, money and uh, raw materials are very scarce. When we talk about, for example, vegetation, water, this is something which is very, very limited, especially in the global south, where, for example, water has been always uh, extremely expensive raw material, and in the future it would be even more. Maybe we would have the next conflicts around water. Mm -hmm. So. This is um, a troubling issue. So how do we uh, manage the transformation, especially by, by having new green cities? So how can we adapt other um, architectural uh, designs which may help us? So I think this is a very good beginning, but I think the mankind has been always dealing also with such climates in various regions of the world. So. I think there is more knowledge in this world if we are ready and open to learn from each other and adapt other um, city building measures. Yeah. When you hear all of this, Matthew, do you think um, that maybe the fact that it's now hitting it hard in the Northern Hemisphere can actually be, in a way, very carefully a positive thing because it shifts change more quickly? Well, I certainly hope so. I th and I think we are you know, seeing people you know, concentrate more on, on, on these issues now. We're sitting here having this discussion, and I, I do think, again, that people here need to really feel it firsthand in order to sort of spur them into action. Um, because, you know, as, as we've heard, it's, it's, it's been a reality in, in the global south uh, for, for some time. And if you follow the news regularly on any given day, I mean, we're feeling it right now in Europe, but on any given day at any time of year, there's going to be, you know, a cyclone or some sort of extreme weather event often and most often in Africa or uh, Asia and, and people here tend not to, to really pay attention. So I think, you know, it is also an opportunity. And the question is, you know, for business in wealthy countries, how are they going to take advantage of this? As, as we heard, the car industry, particularly in Europe, particularly in Germany, was very slow to uh, recognize this opportunity to adapt to this change. And they're still trying to catch up. But you've seen other companies come out, be it Tesla or BYD in China, a big electric car maker, um, you know, take advantage of that and, and be very successful. So I think we shouldn't just focus on, on the positive when having these discussions because there are opportunities there as well. We have time for a very quick last round of yes-no questions. <laughs> Is there room to be optimistic in all of this? Come well, I, I mean, I, I'm very pessimistic but right now, but there is room for optimism, I think, because we have a lot of solutions and we are here the privileged one and can change it. <clears throat> what do you say, McCann? Is there room to be optimistic? <coughs> I, I trust uh, the mankind to be even more um, 
to, to improve the situation, but also inventive. <coughs> On the other side, we need to learn more from the perspective of the others. So it's an extremely urgent issue because people are really suffering right now and we are trying to manage our privilege. So I think people will learn from those uh, perspectives, yes. One last word from Matthew. Uh, well, I would be uh, maybe a little bit more pessimistic in the short term, uh, a bit more optimistic in, in the long term. We will definitely stay with that. To all of you, thank you very much for watching. Remember that you can also watch our program on our YouTube channel. That's DW News. Just look for To The Point. I'm Javier Arias. To all three of you, thank you very much for being here. I hope to see you next time. Take care and goodbye. <laughs>